Hello everyone, thank you all for coming. My name is Marshall Dryling. I'm the Education Manager here at the Branch Museum of Architecture and Design. It's the first time I'm going to say that at a lecture. I'm excited about the name change and being able to say that. Um, I hope you all uh, get a chance to look around the uh, Balance and Motion exhibition. We have our guest curator here, Jesse McCauley. He's uh, hiding in the crowd, but uh, he'll be floating around a little bit later uh, to answer questions. But this is our uh, Bicycles, Shaping Our Past, Influencing Our Future Lecture. Um, we have two excellent speakers here today. Uh, Andy Bano is the urban planner, or, or leads urban planning group for Timmins Group here in Richmond. And then first to start us off, we have Tom Hauk, who is a local author. Uh, we have his second edition here, which he'll be signing a little bit later. And without further ado, I'll hand it off to him. Thank you. All set? Yep. Everything's on. Thank you for coming. Uh, again, my name's Tom Howe. Uh, back in 2010, I was asked to look into the history of cycling here in the Richmond area. Uh, I did it for the centennial of Bryant Park. My cycling team is Alpheus. Uh, we put on the Bryant Park races, which is interesting in itself because the history uh, goes back. I've been racing bicycles since the mid 80s. I knew about Bryant Park and I had no idea when this bike race started. So it was fascinating to me to look into that history and find out that it was a 42-year-old race as of this year. So uh, we, I did the centennial. I found out uh, a lot of material. And I told my friends, my friend Waylon is here, is like I would email him. And it got to the point where he said, stop email, emailing me, condense it, uh, summarize it, and give it to me, because it became so overwhelming when I started to look into the newspapers. Uh, I, I got to tell you, now that I've been, been doing this for five years, I'm really happy to see like what's going on here with this museum. I'm kind of get, getting off the track a little bit. But I got to tell you, it's like I'm really proud of Jesse and what he's done. Uh, this is a very accurate history. It's something that uh, bothers me a lot when I see inaccuracies. Uh, another person, I've got to point out Janet Woody, who's the librarian at uh, Lewis Ganner Botanical Gardens. They also really appreciate the cycling history. When it goes back, in, uh, it's very important to them to get it right. And with the World Championships, it's more important than ever because the entire world is coming. I guess you guys do know that the World Championships are coming, right? <laughs> okay, just um, got to tell you, one of the things that I uh, that troubled me when I first started researching the history is this bias that I have. Is like a lot of the history that I know of is shaped by Hollywood. Uh, you know, you see these. You know, if you love cowboy movies, you, you know the image. The, the guys come run, riding into town. They take the reins. They wrap it around the post in front of the saloon. They go in and they drink all night. And uh, it took me a while to figure out, no, well, hold on a second. It's like, no, people did not ride the horses everywhere. Uh, here in Richmond, especially, I would read stories about police officers who would chase after a, a bad guy. And uh, they're like, yeah, he rode after him. He caught him. And so I just assumed he was, jumped on a horse and rode after him, just like on the, the, the old westerns. No, he was on a bicycle. The police department here in Richmond used bicycles until the 1920s. And uh, moving on. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It was like, I, <laughs> I'm looking at one thing. OK. <laughs> uh, I love this image of John Wayne. It's like a. I'm looking at one, I gotta tell you, I'm looking at one thing and then another thing's on the screen. I'm even looking at the screen. Uh, this, this is really fascinating to me because it's like one of my favorite movies is True Grit and at the end where he rushes, it's like I always pictured him on a bicycle going, fill your hands. <laughs> so uh, the thing about you gotta, you have to know about the history of Richmond too is what the Civil War did to Richmond. It's like I cannot start, uh, Cycling came to Richmond in the late 1870s. But you, if you can imagine what it would be like to have everything around you burned down, to uh, be starving, not all the money in your pocket is worthless. Uh, you have relatives who are dead, your friends are dead. Uh, all, this was, all these problems were piled on Richmond after the Civil War. And it was a 
real rebirth uh, that you, uh, Richmond had to go through. And so when I talk about the history of cycling, is more important for uh, Richmond than uh, really anywhere else in the world because we were re rebuilding. Now, a part of the, uh, the thing about the roads in the country, and Richmonders especially recognize this, uh, guys like Lewis Skinner, the roads were so bad. It's like here in the city, it's like there was a lot of litter, there was a lot of manure on the city streets. Uh, people would walk, there was a lot of pedestrian traffic. Uh, if you were a farmer, you had to navigate these muddy roads to get your produce into the city. That had to be fixed. And uh, guys like Lewis Skinner understood that. He understood that the city of Richmond was bursting at the seams. But, um, and one of the things that uh, improved that was the bicycle. A lot of people assumed that it was all about the trolley, it was, and it really wasn't. Uh, there, when, you, when I talk about the bicycle, everyone assumes, and this was a bias that I had researching the history. I would read about the bicycle in the 1890s, and I would assume they were talking about the penny farthing, the big wheel bicycles. And uh, really, that people who rode those bicycles, it was the, uh, that was pretty much in the late 1870s and into the uh, mid-1880s. And uh, they really, it was almost like a high wire act. You know, people who looked at these riders going down the street on the penny farthings, they really, they laughed at them. They made bets. They were like, he won't make it to the end of the block. I, I bet you $5 he falls off. He has a header where he goes forward. Uh, and uh, so the, when the safety was invented, it changed what people thought of the bicycle because now this was an easier bike to ride. What a safety is, and if you look around the room, whether it's the modern carbon fiber bicycle, whether it's the, uh, any, like the uh, touring bike, um, they're all safeties. Basically, you know, when I talk about the evolution of the bicycle, it ended with the safety. Now, people would always argue with me. It's like, well, what about the derailleur? What about the, uh, you know, the shock absorbers? What about, you know, it's like, hey, I can a cycling computer with 50 functions and it connects to the satellite and I can like download all this information. And, and I'm like, no, it's like, it's still a safety. What a safety is, you have a diamond shaped frame. If you look at the bikes in the back, you'll see a pattern. You'll see the rear triangle where the rear wheel goes into, and then you'll see kind of a tri triangle shape uh, for the body of the bicycle. And they call that a diamond shaped pattern. Now it's like, that meant, that would make the, uh, the rider's center of gravity a little bit lower. Uh, if you notice on the fork, it's, it shapes out, and that's called a rake. The roads were so bad at the time, and even today, there's some, uh, on the modern bicycles, there's a little bit of rake in the fork. What that does is a dampening effect on, uh, for the rider. So it's like when you hit a bump, it flexes, and it uh, absorbs that impact. The other thing that's, uh, about a safety bicycle is you have a crank that's in the center of two almost the same size wheels. That doesn't necessarily have to be the same size, but you can adjust those cranks. It's like you can have a bigger crank in the front and a smaller crank in the back and adjust those cranks for different gearings. So if you have a hilly terrain, you may want to go with an easier to pedal gear. If you know you're on a flat and you like to go fast, you just put a big old chain ring on the front and a smaller chain ring on the back. Uh, all safety bicycles have a chain that propels the rear wheel to make the bicycle go forward. One of them, uh, the other thing is it steers with the front wheel with a headset. Um, it's inherently stable. You can take a bicycle, a, a safety bicycle, actually a wheel. There's something, uh, scientists are still trying to figure out why it is you can take a, a bicycle to the top of a hill, let it roll without a rider, just let it roll down the hill and uh, it's inherently stable, it stays upright. Uh, but the biggest innovation of all was the pneumatic tire, the air-filled tires. It's like you can adjust that pressure up and down and that absorbs the, the, and cushions the shock of the road, especially on the day when the roads were so bad. Uh, the city of Richmond, as I said before, 
was growing. Um, people were living in the city because they had to walk. They were, uh, you know, it was too difficult to hitch up the horse every day and drive a team to work and try to live out in Rico County at the time. Lewis Skinner uh, is a good example because he recognized he he could be he could make money in the real estate business if he bought all the land and gave people the uh, means. Well, he said, "Look, it's like you could live out here." Uh, there's a way, there's like, we're going to fix things, we're going to make it so uh, you can uh, ride your bicycle to work and it's only a 15 minute commute. Now he recognized the importance of cycling. Uh, this is my girlfriend Cheryl, <laughs> I have to brag about her because she found something that amazed everybody. Uh, she found a letter to the editor from Lewis Skinner and it basically, it asked for everyone in the uh, a subscription for the magazine to everyone in Haraiko County. He thought the, the, uh, this magazine is called Good Roads. It's made by the League of American Wheelmen, which was the national body of cycling at the time. They called it Good Roads, and I think it kind of tells you uh, what cyclists thought of the day. They didn't call it Bicycling Magazine. They didn't call it Velo Magazine. You know, Good Roads is kind of a strange name for a bicycling magazine. Um, it was important to them to say, look, it's like in order for our sport to excel, it, uh, we must have better roads. Now, what they would do, um, they described the construction of the roads. Before, it was basically just muddy paths uh, that, you know, uh, and the rainstorm would come through and it would turn it into more mud, more muck. Uh, Horse-drawn teams would get stuck. Cyclists could never make it through. What um, they had the macadamized roads, so you had the crowning of the road, you had it was hard packed, you had gravel over top of that, crushed stone up on top of that. And if it rained, the water ran off to the sides, so it didn't wash away. This is a picture of Brook Road, um, and Lewis Skinner owned all the property along Brook Road. And he understood that, okay, come, to, come live here, you can live here. It's 15 minutes on a bicycle to work. The problem uh, you started to see in the 1890s, the politics, uh, was the bicycle a tool or a toy? Because it started out as a toy. The first person to ride a bicycle in the city of Richmond, his name was Tom Sidner. Uh, Mr. S Mr. Sidner had uh, a well business and uh, Get straight here. It's like um, I'm very nervous. I'm very sorry, folks. This is, I'm not a public speaker. I'm a mailman, so it's like <laughs> it's difficult to um, it's difficult to get up here and speak. Um, it's very important to me to get this right, and I want to make sure it's right. And has to give it to you um, because the bicycle. It, the, there's a similarity here with the bicycle being a tool versus a toy. Um, and it, we're still seeing that today. The, the problem back then was, look, you know, you had people who were using the bicycle and they were going to work and they, were, they were, had to argue for their, uh, they were like, no, no, this is, not, this is not something we play with. This is something we use as a utility. Now, what the League of American Wheelmen did was they started to create laws of, uh, this, that's not the first header, by the way. That is on a safety bicycle. The first header was on a, uh, a penny farthing. Um, one of the things the League of American Women did was they uh, created an etiquette for cycling. In other words, it was funny because it's like I read so many stories about how when you were riding down a road on a bicycle, you would meet a pedestrian, you would meet someone in a car. And you would wonder, like, oh, you know, you would have to stop in the middle of the road and you'd jump around. And you're like, do I go to the right or do I go to the left? It was like an American wheelman who said, you always go to the right. And they started coming up with rules for how to, uh, how to interact with other uh, cyclists, with other pedestrians, with other uh, carts, with, you know, just people who are uh, using the roads at the time. Now you had social groups start to form. In this particular case, this is the Independent Cycle Club. Uh, you also had the Lakeside Wheel Club, 
You also had the uh, numerous of other clubs. Now, they would get together. They were, uh, of course, it was a social club, but they also talked business. Business is very important to them. This club in particular, I like them because they're couriers, they're messengers. They're, uh, one, one gentleman is a bike shop owner, and, uh, and, but they all did work together. They all had drives to like fix potholes within the city um, and to uh, basically have the rules of the road come to the city of Richmond. Now, Lewis Ginner also recognized the fact that it wasn't just cycling. He recognized that he had to create a line of trolleys to, that would go out into, the, um, neighbor, into his neighborhoods that he's trying to build. The thing about the trolley system, not just here in Richmond, um, Richmond's a great example though because you had the trolley systems, you couldn't have a trolley line that went nowhere. You would have to, um, basically you would, uh, the, the people who rode the trolleys, they, had, they would go to places like Lakeside Park, which is now Lewis Skinner Botanical Gardens. You also had people who went to Forest Hill Park. Chimborazo was the end of a line. And the hub of the, the trolleys was Idlewood Park, which was pretty much the, um, basically the bush gardens of the day. You had flume rides, you had roller coasters. You, uh, you know, you go get your pitch taken, go get, uh, they had like um, ice cream. Um, and the, one of the things about, um, you know, talking about the evolution of the whole transportation is the gentleman by the name of B.A. Blunner, who was started out as a bicycle mechanic. Excuse me one second. Hmm. I think B.A. Blunner is a very fascinating individual. Jesse might own a bicycle. The bicycle on the left is a safety bicycle. That may be a B.A. Blunner. We don't know. It's like, um, I'm hoping it is. It would be kind of cool. It's like, uh, but one of the things when people talk about there was a fad in the 1890s with this bicycle, it really wasn't a fad. Because if you think about it, it's like everyone knows how, um, it's a, like a rite of passage in the United States to ride a bicycle. It's, it's a, if your child, if you have a child, you teach them how to walk, you teach them how to ride a bicycle, you teach them how to drive a car. The evolution for transportation in the United States was pretty much like that. You, you, you were walking, you got on a bicycle, and then it, it basically, it didn't take people very long to uh, figure out, okay, if we just put an engine on this thing, it would be so much easier than to have to pedal it. Um, a lot of people, it's interesting because Tom Sinder, who was the first person to ride a bicycle in the city of Richmond, they asked him about it, and he said, um, you know, well, what do you think? You know, are you proud of it? And he said, yes, I am, you know, I'm paraphrasing. But he said, I want to be the first person to drive an automobile. And I always thought that was peculiar because he, um, he knew what an automobile was before he actually saw an automobile. And I read some newspaper accounts where they did talk about the automobile and they wondered, do, do, do our roads, um, fit the needs of the future of transportation with the automobile, with everything that's coming that we don't even know. You gotta remember in the 1890s, you had uh, electricity, you had the telephone, a lot of things were brand new. A lot of the businessmen were trying to take advantage of this. Um, and B.A. Blunner, you could see how his, his basically his bicycle shop evolved into an automobile, automobile dealership. Now, um, he also raced cars. By 1910, he was uh, he actually put on he helped promote one of the first uh, automobile races here in Richmond, and I think that's really fascinating because it's like um, Cheryl and I we live three miles away from Richmond International Raceway, and we we weren't big NASCAR fans, but we decided one night that well we're Richmonders we can actually hear the races from our house. Uh, let's just go to the race. Let's buy tickets and go. But then we, what held us back was we don't want to deal with traffic. It's like, and uh, so we decided, well, let's just ride our bikes. It's three miles away. Uh, I have a friend whose mom lives in a neighborhood across the street from Richmond Inter International Raceway. We could park our bikes there. It's funny because she rents out her front and backyard to RVs. And, uh, you know, so it's a money-making scheme for her. And she's like, yeah, come on over. I'm going to be here. It's like, I'll be watching the yard, take care of you. So we rode out there. 
had a great time. If, I, if you guys haven't seen NASCAR, you've got to go. It's a blast. Matt Kenseth won that night. We were sitting right there. He, I thought he was going to wreck into us. He you know, kept going and won. Uh, we got on our bikes. We rode home. And I'm sitting in the living room. We got ESPN Sports Center on, watching Adrian Matt Kenseth. I saw that. He was right there. You know? And then I get a phone call. And it's a buddy of mine, um, Mark Holley, he's an avid NASCAR fan. And I'm like, you know, Tom, what'd you think? He goes, oh man, it's a blast. It's like, where are you? I'm at home, where are you? I'm still stuck in a parking lot. <laughs> and so it's like, uh, to me that's fascinating because it really tells you like everyone here, is there anybody here that doesn't ride a bicycle? It's like, we're all Americans. Uh, it's an American thing to <laughs> like, <laughs> You've got this European sport coming to the United States, and well, they're saying it's a European sport, and I'm like, well, hold on. It's like, you know, everybody here rides a bicycle, and it's very important. Uh, the thing is, it's like, I think there's some common sense that can be used incorporating the bicycle into transportation, which I'd like to now bring up Andy Bain out. We also did not rehearse dressing each other, so. Um, I'm glad Tom actually brought up the point about transportation versus recreation, because I was supposed to hit on that later, and I completely forgot to incorporate that. So yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good reminder. Um, I think maybe the uh, qualifier for me to talk about tr anything related to traffic was I grew up in Northern Virginia, so I hate traffic. Um, I've been in Richmond for about 12 years now, but um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't grow up in an area where, I mean, I, it, it was, it's Fairfax County, so there were sidewalks and the streets weren't that big, but it's, it's not like it was a bicycling mecca. Um, but I didn't realize as a kid, really all the traffic that we were suffering through was the highway kind of traffic. It was the, it was 95, it was the Beltway. Uh, now the mixing bowl. It, it wasn't our neighborhood streets. I mean, if we needed to get someplace, it wasn't that far away. If, if, my, if our parents were away, my sister and I knew we could ride bikes to, to Blockbuster at the time, Errol's video, they'll never know. I mean, we'll be back in time. So there was an awful lot of freedom, even in Northern Virginia. But this title is uh, very deliberate um, because I don't want you thinking about the future of Richmond that you think is allowable but think about the future that you want. And um, when I was putting this together, I was a little bit presumptuous, and I'm assuming that you want to live happily ever after. And if that's true, that is good. You are in the right place. So a little bit about me. I'm, in a lot of ways, the same person that I was in the first grade. Uh, I don't describe myself as a cyclist. Um, I actually haven't even assembled an adult bike since college. Um, I don't know if you can count putting my kids' bikes together because they pretty much come assembled and I just squeeze the tires and yeah, that's, that's safe. See if it crashes and that's how we'll know if it's safe or not. But um, this week on Tuesday, I was coming out here, we were checking out the exhibit. I had two flat tires on my bike. I was downtown Chaco Bottom, so it should be an easy ride. And panic set in because I, I'm not a cyclist in the kind of true, in the Tom sense. Uh, like, if he was down there with me, he could have made everything right. Instead, I had to go into uh, Jimmy John's, but that's a whole other story. Um, I'm, I'm just a regular guy who wants convenience, like I, I'm guessing many of you. So hearing a lot about the history of Richmond, um, what I wanted to show was not like a space age future, but uh, Maybe this is in your mind two years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever the future means for you. Uh, some people in the back future could mean maybe 70 years from the future, right? You got a long ways to go. Um, but imagine a street network that didn't force you to have to drive a car. It didn't force you to save up money and buy a car and then have to drive it anywhere. But freedom of mobility, like my sister and I being able to sometimes follow our parents' rules where we were riding, sometimes not. Um, but for me, right now, freedom would be able, would be the ability to ride just about 45 minutes from my home in Bonaire, downtown to Shaco Bottom. It's not a long distance. And, and I'm, you know, the previous slide, I'm that guy riding upright. I'm not 
down with the drop bars. So I just want to be able to have a comfortable ride from Bonaire to Shaco Bottom. Imagine um, an environment where everyone sees bicycling as a viable way of transportation. Like Tom was saying, it's not just a toy, it's just it's the most efficient way to move around. I mean, the most fundamental way to move is walking. And then riding a bike doesn't require any fuel other than food and drink. So imagine a safe and convenient way to get around where you can even be social along the way. I mean, you can talk to the person next to you. You can be human. Uh, freedom to ride to lunch with friends in normal clothes. That's exactly how we were dressed while we were riding. Um, we didn't have to worry about parking. There's front row parking. There's like VIP parking at all these different places. So we were choosing where we we're going to eat based on what we felt like eating, not is there any parking nearby. And this actually, it looks like a downtown city street. This is actually a suburb in Buffalo. This is not even a downtown. But imagine, you know, the good roads movement that you heard about. Imagine quality infrastructure that didn't treat local streets like highways. I mean, it's amazing to me. Every time I look at Monument Avenue and I think, holy cow, how am I still alive in Monument Avenue? I mean, it's this historic area. There's all this amazing stuff to see on Monument Avenue. And it feels like a highway. Um, but imagine where a, a future where bicycling accommodations are a given. Um, a future where kids feel completely normal riding on the streets, where you don't feel like, I don't belong here, I should probably be on a sidewalk or in the back seat of a car. But this stuff is not fantasy. It's, ha it's happening all over the world. I mean, these are all pictures that I've taken. This, it's happening in cities and counties all throughout the United States. It doesn't have to just be a European kind of thing. And it can happen here in the Richmond region. It can happen, of course, in downtown streets. It's the easiest to do in city streets, but it can also happen in the counties around us. So I thought the easiest way to kind of talk through the possibilities would be through my personal story. So almost 20 years ago, I learned how to be a traffic engineer. And um, you know why the traffic engineer crossed the road? Because that's what he did last year. That pretty much sums up uh, what we did. I asked questions like an obnoxious kid. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Uh, I was 22 years old and asking those questions. And the answers were generally, because that's how we do it. Because that's how we did it last year. Because your dad did it that way, which he did. He, I mean, th that's kind of the industry. And it's not the only industry like that. There are plenty like that. But the status quo uh, didn't lead me to design streets for people or want streets for people. It didn't lead other people uh, to the same kind of conclusion. The only thing that matters to the status quo infrastructure business is to preserve high-speed car traffic. So even in a place like historic downtown Richmond, where you've got Monument Avenue, where people are just hauling through, even in a, in a setting like that, the industry says, yeah, but is there a way to make them go faster? Um, and convenience is measured not in terms of, will I be able to ride dressed like this to the museum to meet with Tom and Marshall? No, it's measured in a crazy way. It's nonsensical. It's seconds of average delay, se seconds at a stoplight. So because of that, I mean, I've been thinking about this seconds business a lot because uh, I'm trying to brainwash my kids as much as possible. They're nine and almost 10 and 12. So, of course, I want them to think like me because I'm their dad. But I've been thinking good, tra good traffic engineers are like bad parents. Because if your kids are whining, I want this now, 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 you're not going to say, OK, fine. You're, if you're a good parent anyway. But the good traffic engineers, I mean, if you, they're going to say, Oh, you don't want to wait 12 seconds? OK, you don't have to wait 12 seconds. We'll figure out something. We'll, we'll take that person's property and add some lanes so that you don't have to wait 12 seconds. That's, that's kind of what it's like. So what's the consequence from that kind of approach? It's, um, it's devastating. And it's not as though only the lowly people riding a bicycle are the ones suffering. 30 to 40,000 Americans die every year. And those are motorists. Those aren't just people like me coming from one end of town to the other and thought it would be convenient to ride. The, and, and they're not accidents. They're crashes because the infrastructure is deadly by design. Um, 
it's, it's horrible for everyone. I mean, people riding bikes or walking, about 5,000 a year die. But it's the motorists even who, while they think they're getting safer infrastructure, actually aren't. So here's Bonaire. Um, this is right down the street from where I live. And all summer long, you'll see this. In fact, I, it got to the point now where um, my wife asked me to stop saying things to the kids because if I'm not with them, she gets an earful about, mom, can you take a picture of that? Mom, can you take a picture of them? Mom, can you take a picture of them? <laughs> um, but the pool, the library, the old village area down by Forest Hill and Huguenot, people are doing this all the time because there's not really an option. There are a lot of professionals that insist that grown-ups don't ride bikes. That, like, again, Tom's point, it's a toy. Grown-ups don't do this. And I think they're the same people that are convinced that NASA faked the moon landing. And these are the people that are in charge of stuff. They shouldn't be taken seriously. Um, so this kind of exploitation got me so fired up. Uh, I was putting together a short film for a friend of mine, and then I ended up doing this one about this exact thing. Like, car-oriented engineering came with this huge promise, freedom. You will be able to go anywhere you want, as fast as you want, and everything will be great. And then what happened was, with all the promise of freedom, we actually lost our freedom. I mean, one, we're trapped. We have to drive everywhere. And then two, we have to drive in ridiculously dangerous circumstances. So the most dangerous thing I'm going to do with my kids every day is put them in the car with me. So how can you expect to follow the herd and make a dent in the universe? You know, if we're thinking about bringing back kind of this common sense culture of not forcing a person to ride a bicycle, but making it possible for them to ride. You know, the, the Americana kind of thing, like freedom to be able to do what you want to do. Well, right now, you can't really do what you want to do. You're stuck. But if you're going to make a dent, you have to stand out. So that's why I like this quote from uh, Frank Zappa. Here's another good one, though, from uh, George Lewis. Start with a blank canvas and an open mind, not with the nervous borrowings of other people's mediocrities. I like that one a lot. It's long, but I like it. Um, and, and skeptics usually say when you start talking about, well, wouldn't it be great if we did this? You probably want Richmond to be like Copenhagen. And I say, yes, yes, I do. And the crazy thing is, Copenhagen wasn't always Copenhagen. Copenhagen used to look terrible. It used to look like Chesterfield and Henrico and every other place in center, Central Virginia. They, they weren't always bicycle mecca. People weren't flocking there, unless they were flocking to say, oh, I want to go see some deadly infrastructure where everybody's trapped in a car and it sucks. That was what Copenhagen was like. So is it possible? Yes, it's possible. All right, I need the next slide. Um, but yeah, progress, just like in Copenhagen, requires disruption. So again, another real life picture, not something from a space age. Don't apologize when you're talking to your friends or neighbors or planning commissioners. Don't apologize for wanting safer streets. Don't apologize for wanting to reduce the space for cars like this. There, sure, there are going to be some people that say, you, that was a car lane. You took up that car lane. Yeah, it was a car lane, and it was dangerous. We're adding space for human beings to be able to ride bikes. Um, and when places like in this particular example in Seattle, these ideas were spinning around for years and years and years. And it didn't happen until leaders had the willpower to actually make it happen. So this kind of thing, it's absolutely possible when leaders have the willpower. One last thing about this, another great thing about this kind of thing, there's so much public infrastructure. Now, when I say public, I mean in the public right-of-way that's owned by local governments. There's so much of it that you usually can do this stuff without stealing people's private property. You don't have to take front yards. I mean, it's amazing how many people say, oh, you've got to widen that road and take the tree in my front yard that's 150 years old. Oh, where my kids played? Yeah, go ahead and take that for that. We'll give that stuff up all the time. We don't think twice about it. But this stuff you can usually do in what's already out there. I'm not going to talk about parking. I'm just proud of this poster, and I wanted to share it. Uh, you might say, Andy, if the solution is so obvious, wouldn't it be mainstream? Wouldn't we have streets that look like this 
And again, this is not a, this is not Manhattan. Wouldn't we have streets like this in short pomp area of Henrico, you know, places where there's population nodes, where there's a bunch of people nearby? No, it's not gonna be mainstream. Here's another quote why it's not gonna be mainstream. This guy created some of the first computers. He knows something. Don't worry about people stealing your ideas. I mean, this is a guy who uh, eventually made IBM's first computer. If your ideas are any good, you're gonna have to ram them down people's throats. So you've got the internet in your pocket. Um, Google this stuff. I mean, this, this one is uh, Pittsburgh. It's not hard to find great infrastructure, and it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. I mean, yeah, those are ugly bollards, but it made a world of difference. It turned this, what used to be, kind of like our equivalent of Main Street and Cary Street. It was this one-way pair where people were going way too fast in cars, and they, inside of what they already had between the curbs, they made it really comfortable to ride bikes. So now, I've got just a guy by himself, but there were families that ride now because they feel comfortable. Like, I would feel comfortable if my kids had been with me riding in these areas. It wasn't just like, we're telling everyone, lay off the horns when you see families riding on streets. You make stuff comfortable for people to ride. So send pictures, find this stuff, send pictures to people, send them to your local government and tell them, like, demand this stuff, this is what we want. Because the local government people are gonna say, well, we're not, we're not thinking this way because nobody's asking for it. And politicians, don't they work for you? I mean, if your politicians, your elected leaders are working for you, get in their ear about this kind of thing. So, you know, I mentioned the crashes earlier, 30 to 40,000 a year, um, or deaths. People aren't usually sensitive to those kind of abstract facts. Um, everybody has their own personal tipping point about when they think, okay, that is a big deal. Usually it's when it hits close to home. Um, for me, it was a comparison to 9-11 deaths. So I was, in, uh, was working in Fairfax on 9-11, and imagine if traffic deaths in the year all happened in a single day. If we knew one day of the year was traffic crash death and 35,000 people on that day, just boom, dead for the year. I think if that happened, I think then we would say, yeah, maybe it's time to take back our streets. Maybe it's time we design streets for people, um, whether they were walking, riding a bike, or driving a car, but safe streets for everyone. Right, I knew I was gonna need this reminder. Um, here's the, if you only remember one thing all night, please remember this. There is no balanced transportation network. The network will either accommodate people or it won't. It will either accommodate human beings or it won't. It's that simple, it really is. So will we all have better lives if streets are designed for people? Yes, of course we will. And is it practical to design streets for people? I've showed you all those pictures. Yes, it is absolutely practical. And it's probably, there's probably room right now in all these streets to do this. Will it happen if you stay quiet and let professionals make all the decisions for you? No, that's not gonna happen, or it would have happened by now. You're gonna have to ram these good ideas down their throat, like I said earlier. Um, but the good news is you have truth and common sense on your side. I mean, Tom gave you that whole history about normal people doing normal things, running their normal errands using a bicycle. Just remember, cars are not your enemy. But silence is your enemy, so make a ruckus.